bit different, wasn't it, to a usual um, moment of peace? That was excellent. Um, right, at the beginning I mentioned, so today's a youth takeover, if you haven't noticed that already. Um, and we have a preach mania today. So three um, people from, well, two of the youth and one of the youth mums who serves on the team um, and has done for years. So they are the three ladies that are speaking this morning. So first of all... Um, the series that we're looking at is called Walking with Others. And so we've asked the ladies to each talk about um, somebody in the Bible. It's either a friend, a mentor, or a mentee. So first of all, Ruth, would you like to come on over? Let's give Ruth a big encouragement. So if you were here last week, Ruth got baptized, which was so beautiful. Um, and Ruth, you are wonderful. And I'd just love to pray for you before we start. Is that okay? All right. Jesus, thank you for Ruth. Thank you that your spirit rests on her right now. Thank you that she's full of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that she's full of your power and your presence and your confidence. Jesus, thank you that you've gone before her and you speak in and through her today. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So over to you, my love. You can tell us a little bit about who you are, if that's okay. All right. Hello, so as Sophie said, my name is Ruth and I'm one of the youth here. And today I'm going to be talking about friendship using the example of Barnabas's, Barnabas's friendship with Paul in the Bible. So Barnabas is first introduced in the book of Acts when he lays money at the disciples' feet from a field he sold and he is called the son of encouragement. And I think this perfectly sums up what friendship is all about, encouragement. In Acts 9, verse 26, it describes how when Paul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Now, there is something special about each and every one of us which God wants to use to serve and glorify him. Often, it's hard to see that in ourselves, and sometimes others can be blind to it, like the disciples were with Paul. But Barnabas' friend sees that special thing in you. They will believe in you and encourage you and advocate for you because a friend is one of the people on earth who knows you the best. Not only did Barnabas in this scripture fight for Paul's needs and rights, he was fighting for God's will because he wanted to see God's plan glorified in full in his friend. And I think that friends who are eager to see God's plan glorified through you are the best type of friends who are going to be your best encouragers. Barnabas also has this incredible characteristic of loyalty throughout the book of Acts. He basically sticks to Paul's side the entire time, going everywhere that Paul goes, working as a team in their ministry and making sure that his friend was just never alone and always had the support that he needed. The key thing separating a friendship from a mentorship, I think, is that a mentorship is one way, but a friendship is two way. A mentorship is based around advice and wisdom, but friendship is just all about not doing life alone. Personally, I find it so painful to watch my friends go through challenging situations and experience difficult emotions and know that there is no advice I can give or things I can do to change the situation. But actually, the most valuable thing you can be given by a friend is their presence and encouragement through the challenges. It's them being there when you're having those rubbish days, not changing the situation, but just knowing that you're not alone. Loneliness and isolation is increasingly prevalent in this society, and it can be so detrimental to our faith. But as Christians, one of the most powerful tools we have in strengthening our faith is fellowship and friendship. And I want to share a story with you of how I learned that. I went through a period of time when I really struggled to believe in God, but I refused to talk to anyone about it, and I just kept on pretending that everything in my faith was absolutely fine. I was so confused and lost and ashamed that I never admitted it, and I was just so determined to fix my faith all by myself without anyone ever knowing. It failed, miserably. And every week, the burden just grew heavier. Until finally I'd had enough. And I plucked up the courage to speak to an awesome friend, who's actually going to be speaking to you guys next. You're, very, you're in for a treat. And I spoke to her about literally everything. 
and instantly the burden was lifted. Coming to God was so much less daunting and my faith finally started to regrow, all because I just simply wasn't trying to do it alone anymore. This story beautifully demonstrates to me just how important fellowship is because trying to maintain faith alone in such a secular world is almost impossible. It's not how we were created to be. Take, for example, the early church, who would diligently meet together frequently and encourage each other to keep the faith alive. Without friendship and fellowship, the church would not exist, and so seeking that must be one of our top priorities. More recently in my friendships, I have learned the importance of encouraging and holding each other accountable within our individual faiths. Yes, faith is a personal, individual thing, but it should not be a secret. Doing a Bible study with friends used to absolutely terrify us because we just didn't know each other's faiths well enough. But over the years, we've gotten closer and we've pushed each other out of our comfort zones in our Bible studies, in our prayer, in our conversations, in our worship. And doing that has made us grow so much closer to Jesus together And the more that we have pushed each other out of our comfort zones, the more that we have been amazed at what God will do through the simple act of fellowship. One of my favorite examples of friendship in the Bible is the story where the friends of a paralyzed man lower him into the room where Jesus is preaching in order for him to be healed. I absolutely love that it was because of his friend's faith and determination that he was healed that day. Interceding for your friends when they are unable is so powerful. Sometimes you need friends to believe for you, to pray for you, to intercede for you, because you aren't able to for whatever reason. This is one of the greatest displays of love that I think we can all get a lot better at, and I think it would create such a change if we were to do it more. When we need a good example of what a good friend looks like, where better to look than the perfect friendship of Jesus? Jesus is our number one encourager, the best advice offerer, the best comforter, and is the reason that we are never alone. He offers unconditional love to every single person willing to enter into friendship with him. There is nothing that you can do to make him leave your side or give up on you. In times when I have felt so alone, I've been given the image of Jesus just sitting next to me, silently, not saying anything, but comforting me with his arm around me and just sharing in my pain, and that has offered me so much comfort. And I think this is what we need in our friendships. Like Barnabas saw that special gift and calling in Paul, Jesus knows you better than anyone else ever could and wants to draw your special characteristics out of you. If we prioritize growing in our friendship with Jesus, we will learn what a healthy, encouraging friendship looks like and be able to imitate this in our earthly friendships. We should take our example of the friendship of friendship from the perfect friendship of Jesus. The most important thing we can be doing in our lives is drawing nearer to Jesus. And a key part of this is choosing wisely who we surround ourselves with. So I just wanted to leave you with these three questions to reflect on. Do the people you seek advice and comfort from point you towards Jesus or away from him? Do the people you spend the most time with make it easy to remember your heavenly purpose Or are you often finding yourself distracted or tempted? And do the qualities you show as a friend to others, do they reflect the qualities that Jesus shows you in his friendship with you? And finally, I want to leave you with this verse, which has really encouraged me in my friendships. Hebrews 10, verse 24 to 25 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, but encouraging one another. And I think that just shows, brings it all back to encouragement. Friendship is about encouragement, it's about love, it's about fellowship. Ruth, thank you. That was really beautiful and encouraging and thought provoking. Next, we have Francis coming to talk to us about mentorship, looking at the life of Paul. So let's welcome Francis as she comes. Jesus, thank you for Francis. Thank you that she's your daughter in whom you are well pleased. Thank you that you love her and thank you that your spirit rests on her right now. Thank you that you're her peace. Thank you for grace. 
Thank you for courage and boldness. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Francis. You might know that already. But maybe you know me as one of the youth, or maybe you know me as Natalie's daughter. Maybe you don't know me at all. Well, I'm coming to you today to talk about why everybody needs a Paul or a mentor. I don't have a backpack like Steve did, and I don't have a helmet to put on like Elizabeth, but maybe whilst I talk this morning, you'll begin to see the picture I'm trying to paint for you. I'll only ask for one bit of participation. Can I have a show of hands of who loves an IKEA shopping trip? We have some. And who loves putting together their IKEA furniture that they've just bought? Wow, more hands than I thought. Well, as I sat on Wednesday evening and I asked the Lord, how do you want me to talk about mentorship? And from one second to the next, I'm imagining myself putting together an IKEA wardrobe. There's lots of imagery in the Bible to do with building. Building your house upon the rock talks about what you're building your fa- building on, considering your foundation. And we're spoken, we're described as living stones being built together as a spiritual house. And that's talking about what are you building with. But I want to talk about the actual building process. How are we supposed to do our spiritual building? Now, building IKEA furniture is notoriously tedious, overcomplicated, and very frustrating. It's the kind of thing you become skilled at with time and experience, but it's never just going to be that walk in the park. I want you to imagine trying to build this IKEA wardrobe for the very first time, no help, and no clue what you're doing. It's probably the hardest it will get like that. Now, when someone comes alongside you who's tried before, they've done it before, they've got experience, suddenly the process looks much different. You can learn from them, you can pick up the tips and tricks that they've learned from facing the same struggles. And when you look at the instruction manual together, you can more easily make sense of what it's trying to say. You might even find it a fun activity. You can put on some tunes, have fun with each other, have a laugh together, And when things go ridiculously wrong, you just backtrack and try again. You can treat it like a task to tick off, or you can make the most of it, build relationship, and have a memorable experience. I'd like to look at some scripture which particularly encouraged me in this. 2 Timothy 1 verse 4, Paul says to Timothy, As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. Timothy having a mentor like Paul is very much the same as having that person come alongside you and help you. It's a mutually rewarding relationship. Paul imparts wisdom that God has gifted him onto Timothy. Timothy is lifted up by Paul's encouragement and is also held accountable. Paul sees the fruits of Timothy's faith and is filled with God's joy. Just like when you buy that cupboard from Ikea, you are signing up to the task of building it, When we give our lives to Jesus, we are called to walk with Christ together. Whether you're trying to stick that on your own or whether you say, look, Lord, I really need a mentor in this, it's going to heavily impact your experience of that journey. Now, if it's not a necessity, why should we make it a priority as a church? My next image involves fire. I often find myself describing my mum as on fire for Jesus. And I was wondering, where does that come from? Throughout scripture, there's talk of fire in our bones or fire in our hearts. And here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says to Timothy, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. I believe we can find it much easier to feel those flames of God's gift in certain moments. Maybe you've had some really good prayer and ministry time For me personally, it's when I come back from church camp. That's when I'm feeling on fire for Jesus. But what is it that enables that fire? I was thinking about, we learn in school about the fire triangle. For there to be combustion, there needs to be oxygen, there needs to be fuel, and there needs to be energy or heat. Remove any of these three and your fire goes out. If you think about oxygen, a fire will suffocate when it doesn't have oxygen. Your faith will be strangled by that fire blanket. 
This is why it's important that you don't let yourself be consumed by earthly things. We fuel ourselves with spiritual nourishment. We read God's word. We wait on the Lord to hear him. And we listen to the message in church. Lastly, it is energy or heat. Those coals in a fire will heat up together and they'll catch fire. The particles are getting excited and they're shaking with so much energy that it allows that combustion. But if you separate out those coals, they're going to go cold. That energy isn't shared and it dissipates. Your fire will go out. The same goes for the members of a body of Christ. If you are separated from your fellowship or you are separated from your people, you find yourself in that spiritual desert. Now, our incredible youth pastor Sophie has been a mentor to me. Even if we don't always have time to meet up and talk regularly, I learn from watching the way she walks with the Lord. The way Jesus shines his love through her prompts me to love like Jesus has loved us. Now, this relational aspect of fueling your fire is why we all need our own Barnabas, our own Paul, and our own Timothy. I want to leave you today with Proverbs 27, verse 17. Iron sharpens iron, and so one man sharpens another. Thank you for listening. Francis, thank you. Making me emotional. Uh, Oh, Natalie, you're so ready. Come on. Um, This is Natalie, everybody. Um, Natalie is the final person to speak to us today. So let's pray for you, Natalie. (laughs) Oh, Lord, thank you for Natalie. Thank you for the the years and depth of her life with you, Jesus. Thank you, as Francis said, that she is a woman who is on fire for you. And I thank you for the gift that she is to the youth family and the gift that she is to this church. And I pray your blessing over her now as she speaks. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, hi, everyone. I don't think I need to say my name now. (laughs) I'm wondering if God's telling us to um, do a Love Church IKEA trip tomorrow. It's Bank Holiday Monday. (laughs) Um, So I'm married to Pierre, who just won the challenge. Um, My daughter is Frances, who you've just heard speaking. And uh, some of you might remember my son, Leo, um, who's currently at university, but he was a youth intern here last year. So that's me if you have never met me before. Um, My part in today's Preach Mania is about having a Timothy in your life. In other words, having someone who is young or new in their Christian faith, who you are investing in and discipling and helping them to grow. When I was 16, or year 12 equivalent, some of, like some of the guys that I sort of sat on that side of the room, my mentor, a lady by the name of Norma, who would have been a similar age to what I am now, asked me to begin visiting a 17-year-old girl called Miriam because Miriam was a brand new Christian and desperately needed encouragement. My response to Norma was, no way, you have got to be kidding me. The reason for my reaction was that Norma was a lady who ran a prison ministry, and Miriam, this 17-year-old girl, was serving a life sentence in a maximum security prison on the outskirts of my hometown in South Africa. To tell you a bit more about Norma, she was a very tall lady, quite large. She had a larger-than-life personality. She would go into prison every week preaching the gospel leading people to Jesus and praying for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If I use the phrase Pentecostal prayer warrior, that's the sort of lady Norma was, and boy, could she pray. Norma met Miriam and her friend called Tandeka when they'd just arrived in prison to begin serving life sentences. So why were these two girls in prison? 
Back in the late 80s in South Africa, there was a lot of political violence and unrest. Miriam and Tandeka were told that they had to attend a particular political rally that evening. They were threatened that if they did not attend, their houses would be burnt down and their families killed. And so they went along in fear. At this rally, a necklacing took place, which is a form of execution. The police turned up. Everyone fled the scene. But Norma, uh, sorry, Miriam and her friend Tandeka were caught. They were charged with the murder. The witnesses who knew that they were innocent were too afraid to come forward lest they be killed. And young Miriam and Tandeka were sentenced to life in prison. Miriam and Tandeka came along to a Christian meeting in prison with Norma, where they both gave their lives to Jesus. So when Norma asked me to visit Miriam, I said to her, Norma, I'm only 16. I'm far too young. I can't go into that big, scary prison. I've lived a very sheltered life. I'm an innocent, naive young girl. What am I even going to say or share with these girls in prison who've been exposed to such horrible events? Now, Timothy in the Bible was a young man that Paul was raising up and training to be a pastor and a planter of churches. We know from the Bible that Timothy grew up in a Christian home, quite sheltered, because Paul knew Timothy's mother and grandmother. From reading the letters to Timothy, it's clear that this young guy had some tough situations and some difficult people that he had to deal with. I wonder whether Timothy, on occasion, said to Paul, no way, you've got to be kidding. I can't do that. I'm too young. Because Paul writes to Timothy in his first letter saying the following. And this is in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. These words were pretty much what Norma said to me. And she convinced me to go into prison. So I went into prison every weekend to visit. My mum came along with me. She had to drive me there anyway. Um, And she would sit talking to Tandeka and I would sit talking to Miriam. During my visits, I would pray with Miriam. I would share my life. I would share scriptures, and eventually I even taught her A-level history when she was able to pick up her studies because I was doing A-level history myself. All this time spent with Miriam was done sitting in a small booth with bulletproof glass between us, looking through a window at each other and speaking into a speaker that was in front of me. Miriam blossomed and grew in her faith. Every week when I saw her, she was full of joy and thankfulness. And we would laugh together despite her unimaginable circumstances. She was an innocent young girl surrounded by real criminals. Now I realize that this story that I'm sharing is a pretty unique example of discipling someone Because generally speaking, in more normal circumstances, discipling might be around my dinner table, over a coffee at a cafe, or even just stood in my kitchen chatting to the people that come in and out through my home. A scripture that God pressed on my heart recently is found in the Gospel of John. Right at the end, where Jesus asks Peter, Do you truly love me? And Peter says, Lord, of course I love you. And Jesus replies, 
feed my lambs. These lambs are not just referring to children or young people, but also to those who are new to the faith or young in terms of their spiritual journey. Going back to Miriam's story, when things were more settled in South Africa, the witnesses who could testify in favor of Miriam and her friend came forward and the case was reopened. Their sentences were appealed and they were acquitted of the crime. I was at university at this stage and Miriam wrote to me before she was released from prison, thanking me for the years that I had invested in her life. Her letter said, I was like a plant that was withered and dying, but you came and watered me and fed me And because of that, I am alive. Paul writes to Timothy, and he's actually writing from prison in his second letter. He says, be prepared in season and out of season to share God's word, correcting, rebuking, and encouraging others with great patience and careful instruction. Norma, who was my mentor and a woman I will never forget, not only encouraged me, but she also held me accountable. She urged me to live my Christian life with integrity and godly character. Even today, I still think about words that Norma spoke into my life. In closing, I want to encourage you that although you might not be faced with an extreme situation like I was with Miriam, Whenever you do have people coming across your path or situations presenting themselves where you can encourage someone or invest time in their spiritual life, I would encourage you to go for it. It is incredibly rewarding and it will enrich your life in Jesus in a beautiful way. After all, our Christian journey is not about talking the talk, it's about walking the walk with others. Thank you for listening.